So what do you do when you've got an engine swapped classic mini, but all the bits that hold the wheels on are still classic mini? Custom drive shafts, that's what you do. Welcome to Making for Motorsport, where we make more, spend less, and go faster. So we're in the garage looking at my classic Mini, which I use for auto testing. So that's got a 1600cc engine and gearbox from a Vauxhall. Why? Well, because the standard A series was hardly a powerhouse, and the gearboxes on these Vauxhalls are great for auto testing because well, reasons. Either way, it's a solid engine and transmission package. That leaves me the tricky proposition of connecting up these bits to these bits. Because at the moment, I'm still running the classic mini outer CV joints, hubs, and all the suspension. And Vauxhall, the classic mini, does not go. So the plan is, we're gonna do a good old fashioned cut and shut. We're gonna take a mini shaft and a Vauxhall shaft, cut them down to the right length, and weld them together. So we're gonna find out how long the shaft needs to be. We're gonna cut them down and prepare the ends, TIG weld them together, measure and correct for straightness, weld on a sleeve and call it job done. Now I know this isn't the best way of making custom drive shafts, much in the same way as I know that getting on an aeroplane with other people isn't the best way of going on holiday, but just like we don't have private jet money for this channel, we also don't have custom machined and heat treated drive shaft money and anyway you guys know by now that i'm not going to spend hundreds of pounds on something that i can bodge together perfectly well in my own garage so let's crack on so first off we need to know how long to make these and for that we need to know about plunge so this is a drive shaft cv joints at one end CV joints at the other end. And one of these ends will have plunge on the joint. So as well as being able to move with axial misalignment, the shaft can move in and out. Why do we need this? Because it allows the drive shaft to lengthen and shorten as throughout the suspension movement because the suspension moves on a different radius than the drive shaft. So this is all important because if we run the shaft too long and we run out of plunge and bottom out the inner joint and ask the outer joint to do it, well, it's not. It'll simply do its best grenade impression instead because it's not designed to do it. And if we run the shaft too short and run out of plunge the other way, then we'll just end up pulling the inner joint clean out of the gearbox. And also when we're generally running at normal ride height, we want to have the inner joint running in the middle of its movement. So we're giving it the easiest life possible. So this means the length of the shaft is just as dependent on the suspension movement as it is on the gap between the wheel and the gearbox. So the easiest way of working this out is to cut the shafts down to a sensible length, strap them together with a healthy amount of overlap and put them on the car. Once we've got it on the car, we move the suspension to normal running ride height then we put the inner shaft in the middle of the plunge on the inner CV joint and put a line across the two shafts so we know their position relative to each other. Then we move the suspension through the whole range of motion and as long as those marks don't move then we know we're not bottoming out the inner shaft in either direction. That all looks good to me and at the very bottom of the travel I check there's a little bit of movement left on the inner joint which there is. So that's my length of the shaft, so we're going to take that off and go to the next stage. So what we need to do now is find the point where the diameters are most alike between the two shafts, because they can see they step down and step up. So that'll make it easiest to weld them together if the diameters are the same. 25.2. And once you've found the closest diameters, mark it up and let's make sparks. So 
So now we've got the two ends of the shaft precision prepared with the grinder. And you see all I've done is put a healthy chamfer on the outside so, so I can get a decent amount of penetration. I'm not too worried about getting right to the middle of the shafts with the welding because quite honestly, they do nothing anyway in transferring the torque at the very center of the shafts. It's all on the diameter. So now we've got them prepped. We need a way of rigging them so they are coaxial. That is the center line of this is on the center line of this. Now they will move kind of like this slightly with the, um, with the heat and the welding, but we can sort that out after. But what we can't do is move them. So if I weld them offset like that, there's no one doing that. So we've got to make sure they're coaxial. So to achieve that, we're going to use this piece of aluminium extrusion. So if we lay this in here, you can see it contacts the shaft on the radius, on two radiuses, that way and that way. And if I do the same with this one, that allows me to say that they're parallel. However, they're not coaxial because this is on a smaller radius to those two contact points. But if I shim this up by half of the diameter difference between the two, then that should mean that they are completely coaxial. So if we measure this one, Twenty four point kind of eight four. No, twenty four, twenty three point kind of seven, maybe seven two. So we've got about one point one give or take a couple of thou difference in the diameter. So if that means I shim this off the angle by 0.55, it should be perfect. And as luck would have it, I have the shims here to do exactly that. So 1 1.2, 0 0.3, 4, 0 0.5. So there's our shim pack. So what we'll do is we'll set it up. So firstly, we get it tacked up, double check it looks good before we really go to town on it and then start filling the weld. And we need to build it up evenly. So we go from one side of the shaft to the opposite side try and balance out some of the distortion we're going to get when this weld cools. So I'm using my 160 amp TIG welder for this and I think TIG's the best process because you can pump heat into the joint separately from adding metal but also because I've got one and it's my favourite process. And if I didn't have a TIG welder I would probably use a stick instead. Yes removing all the slag is going to be a headache but that method gives you lots more penetration over a similarly powered MIG welder. So once we've ground the weld flat-ish, it's time to double check that this thing's still straight. So I put it on a pair of V-blocks in my hydraulic press, put the DTI onto the smoothest surface I can find and spin it. First reading is nearly 2 mil of TIR, which is far too much. So we're going to use the press to straighten this out. So rotate the shaft until you pick up a high point with the DTI. Rotate it so that's underneath the press tool and press it. Now there's no real answer as to how hard to go. You've just got to get the feel for each individual shaft. But you can help yourself by marking up the high point and then checking that that's still the high point next time. If it's moved to the other side, then you know you're pressing it too hard. So after one, two or 12 or 13 goes, you can see we're now at six thou run out, allowing for a couple of blips for the rather ropey kiss of the grinding wheel finish. So that, 
I'm going to say is good because any attempts to take out that sixth hour will just make it worse. So the last thing to do on the shaft is to reinforce the joint with a sleeve. So I've got a bit of tubing that I know is the right size. It's just ever so slightly larger than the biggest diameter that we're joining and cut off a length that's larger than the joint and then split it down the middle. From there, position it on and weld it in place. The sleeve has been cut in half to allow us to fit it to the two different diameters of shaft easier. If both shafts were the same diameter, I'd be inclined to leave this in one piece, but obviously put it on the shaft before we weld them together. And underneath, I wasn't killing myself for the best possible weld. It wanted to be good, but it didn't need to be fantastic. On the outer surface here, we need to make sure that we've got the welds as good as possible because any undercutting or pinholing is going to act as a stress razor that's going to give us problems over the long term. And there you have it, fully welded looking pretty good i'm no tig welder as you can see but i reckon those welds are going to be strong enough so there's two things we've got to check for now whether it's still straight our sixth thou run out has grown to about eight thou but that's good enough for me but equally are there any issues with the welds that we can't see so for that we're going to use dye penetrant testing so this is a form of non-destructive testing that shows up small hairline cracks or pinholes in welds and other metallic surfaces so it's a very simple process first we clean the area then we apply a penetrant so this is a very very low surface tension high colored fluid that essentially gets drawn into any cracks that there might be in the surface we leave that for 15 minutes. We then clean off all the excess penetrants and then spray on a developer, which is basically like a spray on talc. This then draws that penetrant back up out of any crevices or cracks that it's been drawn into. And that penetrant displays itself in the color on the developer. So this all looks pretty good, apart from this bit here so this would be a cause for concern after i clean it off i can see there's a slight pinhole here now if i was going for perfection at this stage i would grind this out and re-weld it and then retest it however time is against me and i've got to get this shaft together and on the car so i'm going to call this good and then revisit it in a couple of events and see if it's got any worse so on with the cv joints and then put it on the car. Keyboard warriors, put down your outrage before you get on there and tell me how this will never work and the weld will never hold. This isn't my first rodeo. So I've made quite a few of these shafts because usually they break at the mini end here and they either twist off the splines completely or they break in this narrowed area here with the exception of this one. So this is actually broken on the Vauxhall side on the heat affected zone on the weld and yeah it broke but it's been on there for a couple of years and if we look at the fracture that rough section around the outside of the the shear well that's where the crack started and you see lots of ratchet marks where they all met and then the smooth section is the final bit that sheared so had I even looked at this maybe one or two events before it failed I'd have spotted this, especially if I use the dye penetrant spray. So that's a new maintenance regime that I need to do. And if you needed more evidence, this video is me using the shaft that we've just made. So this is me at a shakedown practice day, getting ready for the new season of auto testing, which is very exciting. All went well, so getting out there this year. that's it for this one guys if you're still watching now then please hit the thumbs up it really does help and if you want to support the channel some more then please head over to the patron and consider joining these wonderful human beings here and get some extra bonus content whilst you're there if you found this video interesting or useful then please let me know down in the comments uh, especially if you're planning a crazy engine swap because engine swaps they're, ju they're just the best mods fact I promise there's more Project Siesta content coming. I've got a small supply issue in that apparently 
some eBay sellers just don't just don't feel like sending out stuff that they've sold. Just it's fine. I'll take your money. I might send it. Yeah. Not that I'm bitter, but if you enjoyed this, I've got a video here that you'll probably enjoy, and consider subscribing down there and hit the bell so you don't miss a thing. But that's it for this one. So until next time, guys, be good. And if you can't be good, don't get caught.